Gross, uh, welcome in the name of enough for this video. Welcome to another exciting video, in this case part 22 of my organisational series. In this video, I'll attempt to provide an overview of the structure of the PRC Eastern and Southern Theatre Commands. Rather than cover the entire armed forces of the PRC, I wanted to focus on the Eastern and Southern Theatre Commands only, as this will be the primary forces involved in any potential invasion of Taiwan. Obviously, many of the low-level formation structures will be identical to other commands. This shows the location of the Eastern Theatre Commands, with Taiwan just directly off the coast. The Southern Command will also likely support the Eastern Theatre Command in any major amphibious operation against Taiwan, especially as two of the all-important six amphibious brigades are deployed in this region. Let's first look at the Eastern Theatre Command. This shows the locations of the military assets of the Eastern Theatre Command. This slide or image gets a little bit too busy, so let's initially focus on only the PLA forces. This shows the deployment of all known PLA brigades. In addition, there are 10 brigade locations which are not known. I would expect they are mostly down south. I find it interesting how many brigades are up north. If you look down south and assume most, if not all, of the unknown brigades are in this location somewhere, then the PLA has 15 frontline combat brigades available for any invasion, which I must admit is more than the ROCA, or Republic of China Army, but not a lot more. As some of the brigades up north are amphibious, I'd expect those brigades from the north would also be used in any initial invasion. If we include the forces in the north, we have a force that includes an additional 12 brigades. The PLA Ground Forces component of the Eastern Theatre Command is comprised of three major core size units, the 71st, 72nd and 73rd Group Army. Each group army doctrinally commands 12 brigades, 6 combined arms brigades and 6 support brigades, including aviation, artillery, air defence, CBNRN, special operation forces and other military assets. Headquartered in Shuzhou, Changshu, the composition of the 71st Group Army matches the Chinese Doctrinal Group Army structure, commanding six combined arms brigades and seven support brigades, specifically four heavy, one medium and one light combined brigade. The 72nd Group Army, headquarters in Huzhou City, Zhenjiang Province, is understood to comprise of one heavy, two amphibious, one medium and one light combined arms brigade. Supporting this is an Army Aviation, Artillery, Air Defence, Special Operations and Supply Brigade. As one of two group armies in the Eastern Theatre Command with amphibious combined arms brigades, the 73rd Group has been prominently featured by Chinese media conducting amphibious landing drills in Fujian Province, demonstrating its capability to take part in the use of force against Taiwan. The 73rd Group Army is understood co to comprise of one heavy, two amphibious, one medium and one light combined arms brigade. Supporting this is an Army Aviation, Artillery, Air Defence, Special Operations and Supply Brigade. The PLA Ground Forces component of Southern Theatre Command is comprised of th two major core size units, the 74th and 75th Group Army. The 74th Group Army will likely be involved in any invasion of Taiwan, and while I do not have the location of the various formations, this map shows what may be a likely base. The 75th Group Army is not shown and is likely to not be involved in any invasion as it guards the borders of the PRC. However, the 121st Air Assault Brigade could be involved. As this formation is air transportable, it could quickly be redeployed for any invasion. The 74th Group Army comprises of one heavy, two amphibious, one medium and two light combined arms brigade. Supporting this is a special operations, army aviation, artillery, air defence, engineer and chemical and supply brigade. It's likely this would be involved in supporting any invasion of Taiwan as to succeed all the amphibious brigades would be required. The 75th Group Army comprises of two heavy, one mountain, one medium, two light combined arms brigades as well as one air assault brigade. Supporting this is a special operations, artillery, air defence, engineering, chemical and supply brigade. 
The Air Assault Brigade would likely be involved in supporting any invasion of Taiwan as the PRC, or PLA, requires all airborne and all amphibious forces to be involved to even have any chance of success. The primary frontline formation in the PLA are the Combined Arms Brigade. Based on Chinese media reports, Combined Arms Brigades probably are designed either as heavy, armor or mech, or light, like mechanized or mountain. There is a medium class which seems to include armoured battalions. I'm uncertain how accurate this source is, but I've included a link to the site in my notes, and it provides a fairly detailed breakdown of the various formations. As this source is the most coherent, I shall use it in my drill down into the structure of the PLA. Each combined arms brigade, in this particular case specifically the heavy, comprises of four combined arms battalions, a reconnaissance battalion, an artillery battalion, an air defence battalion, an engineer and chemical defence battalion, a communication battalion, a combat or service support battalion, and a guard and service company. Each heavy combined brigade has between 5,000 and 6,000 soldiers and 112 tanks in eight to nine battalions. Each heavy combined arms battalion consists of two mechanised infantry companies, two armed companies, an artillery company and a support and headquarters formations. Each tank company has 14 tanks in three platoons of four tanks each, plus two tanks for command and control. The mechanised infantry seem to be mounted in wheeled inf infantry combat vehicles, but tracked infantry combat vehicles would also be highly likely. I feel the artillery is likely 122mm self-propelled howitzers, and the main battle tanks would be the Type 96B. The medium infantry combined arms brigade consists of four mech infantry battalions, two tank battalions, which is between 35 and 40 Type 99 tanks each, which are broken down into 11 tanks, each in three tank companies, plus two tank, com tank command tanks in Battalion HQ. We also have an artillery battalion which comprises of 18 122 PLZ-07B self-propelled howitzers, one engineer battalion, one signal battalion, one air defence battalion, one logistics support battalion, one HQ company. I must be honest and I find it unusual that there are two tank battalions in a formation called Medium Infantry Com Com uh, Combined Arms Brigade. So I'm not sure how accurate this is. Because there seems to be only one of these in each army, it may be possible, but why call it medium? If we look at the word zhong jing hi, then that means medium size, not medium weight. So medium could ref refer to the size of the formation and not that it's a heavily armoured formation or a lightly armoured formation. This could imply that its uh, strength is uh, probably around about the 5,000 man mark, um, possibly even slightly less. The medium combined arms battalion consists of three mech infantry companies, 10 IFVs in each, um, infantry fighting vehicles, one assault gun company, which comprises of 1,405mm wheeled guns, one firepower company or heavy company, which consists of... Uh, 120 or 82 mil mortars, uh, man pads and crew weapons, one support company and one HQ unit. The tank battalion is a bit of an unusual formation. I've only found it in one source, but the tank battalion comprises of three companies, each of which has 11 tanks organised into three companies of three tanks with two command tanks. The source seems to indicate these are probably Type 99s, which are the most advanced main battle tank in the PLA. It's also interesting to note that these tank companies are organised differently from the tank companies in the combined mechanised tank battalions, or infantry battalions. The Light Combined Arms Brigade consists of four infantry battalions. Three are motorised light infantry battalions, and one is a high mobility infantry battalion. In addition, there is an artillery battalion, air defence battalion, combat support battalion, logistics support battalion, reconnaissance battalion, and a guard and service company, as well as HQ uh, capabilities or facilities or formations. The Light Combined Arms Battalion consists of three motorised infantry companies with 10 APCs or wheeled vehicles in each, one firepower company or heavy weapons company comprising of 6 to 9 82 mm mortars, man pads, sniper and crew weapons, one support company, one HQ unit, 
A light combined arms battalion usually has around about 500 personnel in it. The High Mobility Combined Arms Battalion consists of three motorised infantry companies, 120 troops each, in CSK-141 wheeled vehicles, one firepower company, which comprises of two three-vehicle platoons with 82mm mortars, sniper squads, ATGMs, man pads, one support company, one HQ unit, and the light uh, CO battalion would probably have a similar amount of manpower to the previous battalion, which is around about 500 men. The PLA decided to discard the Soviet system of command in which regimental HQs did most of the planning and staff work for battalions. The PLA has now eliminated regiments from the chain of command. Battalions will now be capable of planning and executing operations independently. Battalion commanders directly command a deputy battalion commander, master sergeant, chief of staff and four non-com officers. There is a political commissioner who can lead the combat operations if needed, but his main function includes political indoctrination, morale and adherence to party directives. It should be noted that the Russians did also remove their regiments from their structure. So um, while this is discarding the Soviet system, it kind of mirrors the current Russian structure, which has proven not to be that effective in the Ukraine particularly, but that could be because it's not within a brigade structure. At least the PLA has a brigade structure with additional support equipment to give it those formations a bit more staying power. The reconnaissance battalions uses um, multiple types of resources to conduct humint, uh, elint and behind enemy line operations. In this case, uh, there is a UAV company, um, multiple types, uh, two recon company squads, mostly equipment with light armoured vehicles, one battlefield surveillance company, one HQ unit. There seems to be a great deal of variety in this formation. In this example, we have a tank company. So there may be a different version of the reconnaissance battalion for each type of combined arms brigade. Most of the artillery battalions also possess anti-tank units in addition to the howitzers and MRLSs. In this case, uh, we have two to three 155mm self-propelled howitzer batteries. Each battery consists of three platoons with three guns each. Some would have 122mm self-propelled howitzers. There is one anti-tank company armed with either anti-tank guns for the older or ATGMs. There is a HQ unit, one support company, and a 122mm rocket battery, which is broken up into three platoons of three launches each. The Air Defence Battalions are meant to provide mobile defence cover for the combined arms brigades against specifically helicopters, drones and other low-flying aircraft. It consists of one Shorad battery with eight launchers and one to two radar, three anti-aircraft gun batteries, six guns each, mostly self-propelled, one HQ unit and one support company. A huge proportion of Chinese artillery firepower consists of 122mm howitzers and rockets. Most of these systems are gradually being replaced with 155mm howitzers and 300mm rockets. Uh, there are 152mm howitzers in there and they're also mainly the older weapons. That being said, older calibers are still in use and will likely stay in service for a long time. Following is the structure of an older independent artillery brigade. It consists of two battalions with a total of 36 uh, weapons. They are normally truck-mounted PCL-181, 155 or 152mm howitzers or the older 122 or 152mm howitzers. This is broken up into three batteries with four to six guns each. There are also two battalions of PHL-03 300mm MLRSs, which are multiple launch rocket systems. There are a total of 36 of each weapon in each battalion, or sorry, 36 weapons in both battalions, so there are 18 in each. The artillery brigades in a group army with a combined arms structure have the following units in them. One heavy rocket battalion, 300 millimetres, uh, which comprises of three batteries with four launches each, that's 12 launches in each battalion. One or two light rocket battalions, that's 122mm rockets, uh, it's broken up into three batteries with nine launches in each, total of 27 launches in each battalion. 
Then we have two towed or self-propelled 122 or 155 millimeter howitzer battalions. This is broken up into three batteries with four to six guns each. That's 24 to 36 guns in each battalion. We also have a HQ unit, a support company, a UAV company, and a target acquisition unit. The air defence brigades in the PLA structure are meant to provide point defence for mid-tier level AA or air defence purposes. Older air defence brigades usually have the following units. One battalion, 24 units of 35mm towed AA, and 12 short to mid-range SAM launchers like the FM-90 or HQ-7 SAMs. The modern air defence brigades in a group army with a combined arm structure have the following a structural organisation. One medium range SAM battalion, which normally consists of three batteries with one radar section and three launcher sections. Two Showrad battalions, which consist of three batteries of six to eight AA guns and four to six short range SAMs each. One HQ unit, one support company, one electronic warfare battalion consisting of uh, three companies. Special Operation Brigades attached to the Group Army specialise in reconnaissance and operations behind enemy lines, usually in the type of theatres that are, they are deployed in. There are multiple types of Special Operation Brigades specialising in operations in different terrains such as mountainous, forest, urban and amphibious. I have no example of the structure of any of these formations, so I have no idea how large or small they may be. Most PLA Army Aviation Brigades have a mix of transport, attack and scout helicopters and the type of helicopter varies with each unit. A generic um, uh, Army Aviation Brigade has the following units. One attack battalion consisting of 16 helicopters in two battalions, mostly WZ-10s. Four transport battalions, 8 to 12 medium helicopters in each battalion. One reconnaissance battalion, eight recon or light attack helicopters and of course one support battalion. The service support brigades provide services like transport, medical repair, supplies, logistics and communication to the rest of the units. They also cover the ECM and other EW or electronic warfare mission profiles. I do not have any structures for this formation so I can't uh, provide you with an idea of exactly how large or small they are. The Engineer and Chemical Defence Brigade consists of sapper units providing services such as mine operations, protection against chemical attacks, bridging, battlefield construction, among a few others. I have no idea of the formation structure, but at least three battalions, with possibly a fourth battalion, which is a bridging battalion, seems reasonable, and lots of other specialist formations. I suspect that uh, most of the engineers here are not combat engineers. Using another source that I possess, this shows the composition of a combined armed mechanised infantry battalion. This shows a high mobility within a high mobility brigade. Each uh, has a combined arms battalion, or each combined arms battalion has three rifle companies with 120 tro troops each, which form the manoeuvre component. Company is led by a company commander, political commissioner, and respective deputies. Battalion HQ may have a battalion commander's vehicle and artillery command vehicle. Each company has three rifle platoons, one firepower platoon and 30 ICVs or infantry combat vehicles for troop transport and fire support. Light or motorised units have diesel trucks for troop transports. Each platoon has 30 troops in three squads including a platoon leader and a radio operator. Each nine-man squad consists of an NCO squad leader and eight troops conscripts. Other staff includes a company chief NCO, supply clerk, two radio operators, armourer, operations and reconnaissance officers, artillery and engineer officers, communication officer and support officer. Fire platoons uh, usually have 60 mil mortars in two squads of three troops each. A firepower company with battalion HQ may also have an 82 mm SP mortar, Sniper squads, sometimes equipped with 12.7mm anti-material rifles and ATGM uh, missiles. Service command support companies take care of reconnaissance, UAV courages, transportation, engineering, supplies and medical support. Let's now look at the weapon systems in a bit more detail. I'm not going to go into great detail as there are a lot of videos out there in YouTube which can provide much more information concerning 
armour protection and penetration and all that sort of stuff. But uh, to give you a rough idea of the weapon systems in the PLA, let's start with light tanks. The Noriko Type 63 is a Chinese amphibious light tank. First fielded in 1963, it is in many ways similar to the earlier Soviet PT-76. More than 1,500 have been built. Because the Type 63A was mostly designed for amphibious operations against Taiwan, it is presumed that it would be a, or the basic vehicle used in amphibious invasion of Taiwan, although there are replacement vehicles coming online at the present moment. The Type 59 main battle tank is a Chinese-produced version of the Soviet T-54A tank, an early model of the ubiquitous T-54-55 series. While produced in large numbers and still in service, this is not likely to be any frontline units. The Type 69 and Type 79 main battle tanks are Chinese second generation main battle tanks. Both were developments of the Type 59 medium tank, a locally produced Soviet T-54A, with technologies derived from the T-62. They were, first the, they were the first indigenously developed main battle tanks by China. Today, only a couple of hundred Type 69 slash Type 79s remain in PLA inventory, mostly deployed with training or reserve units. The Type 69 slash Type 79 are being replaced by the newer Type 60, uh, 96 and Type 99 main battle tanks. The Type 85 main battle tank is a second generation MBT based on the Type 80. While superseded by the Type 88, about 600 Type 85s are in service today. By the beginning of 1989, Norinco officially announced it had developed two new main battle tanks based on the Type 80 main battle tank chassis in association with the 201 Institute. Other manufacturer design officers apparently also submitted their designs. The Type 85 2 and Type 85 2A emerged from this. It's unlikely that any of these tanks would be in any frontline service, particularly for any invasion of Taiwan. The Type 88 is a Chinese second generation main battle tank. About 400 to 500 Type 88 A's slash B's are in service with the PLA today. It is an improved Type 80 main battle tank. The improved version of the Type 80, which entered service in 1988 under the title Type 88 PLA designation, more than the former, it integrates a large number or amount of Western technologies in it. The design is similar to the Type 80 slash 2 to the extent of the first storage rack, rack removed to fit a set of explosive reactive armour bricks. Production of the Type 88 series main battle tank was stopped in 1995, but about 400 to 500 are in service with the PLA today. It's unlikely any of these would be involved in any frontline actions, particularly in Taiwan. The Type 96 or ZTZ-96 is a Chinese second generation main battle tank. The final evolution of the Type 88 design, the Type 96 entered service with the PLA in 1997 and over 2500 were produced. And this main battle tank constitutes the main frontline main battle tank in the PLA today. The Type 96 MBT is largely a transitional second, third generation main battle tank, which resulted from a long, pragmatic and properly Chinese evolution and followed by the Type 96G in 2006 that set up new standards for future upgrades. The importance of this tank by numbers and capability must not be underestimated. It has replaced completely all the previous types in frontline operation, and which the others are now in largely in mothballs. The Type 99 or ZTZ-99 is a Chinese third generation main battle tank. This is the state of the art modern battle, main battle tank of the Chinese army and up to 1200 have been produced. I'm assuming they are mainly deployed in the armoured battalions, although I'm sure as their numbers increase they'll start creeping into the other armoured formations, replacing the previous um, Type 96. The Chinese WZ-550 tank destroyer is a wheeled 4x4 version of the ZSL-92 mounting a traversable weapon station. This consists of a x4 ready-to-launch HJ-9 anti-tank missiles, which are laser-guided onto their targets. The station mounts a periscope optical day sight, 7km range, and has a thermal channel. 
The ZBD-2000 built to replace the obsolete Type 63 amphibious tank and at the same time to counter a counterpart of the modernised Type 63A, it was developed especially for extended naval capability or to extend the naval capabilities of the PLA Marines and to conduct large-scale seaborne assaults. The main platform was therefore intended as a common basis for several types of additional vehicles, including one version armed with anti-tank guided weapons. However, I must admit, not being able to find any images of the anti-tank guided weapon version, so maybe it doesn't exist yet, I'm not quite sure. What we see here is the light tank version, which uh, supplements the older Type 63A amphibious tank, which would be deployed in the amphibious brigades. The PTL-2 Tank Hunter self-propelled assault gun with the Type 86 100mm high-velocity smoothboard cannon is an effective assault gun. It was introduced into the PLA in 2002. The Type 63 um, APC is a Chinese armoured personnel carrier that entered service in the late 1960s. It was the first armoured vehicle designed in China without Soviet assistance. The Chinese Marine Type 63C is a Type 63 with amphibious pontoon ends, which provides additional buoyancy as well as improved seaworthiness for amphibious operations. This would almost certainly be the Type 63 used in the amphibious brigades. The Type 77 is a Chinese amphibious armoured personnel carrier first field in 1978. It was similar to the Soviet BTR-50 in function. However, the two vehicles share little in the design as the Type 77 is based on the Soviet Type 63 or on the Type 63 light tank, which in turn was based on the PT-76, which is a Soviet light tank. The Type 8589 is a tracked armoured fighting vehicle produced by China. It was an improved version of the Type 63 armoured personnel carrier. The vehicle is bigger, has additional firing ports and periscopes, a large, longer chassis and additional road wheels on each side and is equipped with NBC protection systems. The Type 85 was the export version. The Type 89 was the version used by the People's Liberation Army, as you can see here. The WZ551 is a Chinese wheeled infantry fighting vehicle um, the name WZ551 actually covers two families of vehicles with the official designation, or with this official designations in the PLA, of Type 90 and Type 92. Over 3,000 WZ551s are in service with the PLA, and they are mainly used by the medium mechanised infantry units. The Type 92B IFV, or WZ551B1, and also with the designation of ZSL 92B is an upgraded amphibious armoured personnel carrier with the ZPT 9930mm autocannon. It is manoeuvrable and reliable and amphibious and no doubt is in the amphibious brigades or is contained in those brigades. The WZ-523 is a six-wheel Chinese armoured personnel carrier designed to be amphibious, built on the chassis of the Hanyang HY472 truck, it can carry a crew of three and seats up to eight additional passengers. The Type 86, also known as WZ501, is a Chinese copy of the Soviet BMP-1, that's called the Type 86, and BMP-2, which is called the Type 86G, infantry fighting vehicle. The ZBD-4, or Type 04, is a Chinese infantry fighting vehicle. It bears some external resemblance to the BMP-3, particularly with regards to its turret and main armament. However, the chassis and internal subsystems possess a different layout. The Type 5 amphibious armoured vehicle is a family of amphibious tracked armoured fighting vehicles developed by China for the Army Marine Corps. It consists of two main combat variants, the ZBD-5, Infantry Fighting Vehicle, and the ZTD-5, Assault Vehicle. The HQ-7 is a short-range surface-to-air missile. In 2009, the HQ-7B was deployed by the PLA in batteries of four HQ-7B vehicles, one with acquisition radar and three TELAR vehicles, supported by a maintenance group with ten support vehicles. 
The PL-9 is a short-range infrared homing air-to-air -air missile, AAM. It's normally towed but can be mounted on wheeled and tracked vehicles as well. The Type 95 is a Chinese self-propelled anti-aircraft vehicle. It's armed with four 25mm calibre cannons and optionally four fire and forget QW2 infrared homing missiles. The PLZ-5, or the Type 5, is a 155mm self-propelled howitzer, first produced in 2003. Actually, it's more likely a self-propelled gun rather than howitzer. The PZL-45, or Type 88, is a Chinese self-propelled howitzer, also 155mm. It was developed in the 1980s slash 1990s by Noricom. The PZL, or PLZ-45, entered service in 1997. The Type 89 self-propelled howitzer, military des designation PLZ-89, is a 122mm self-propelled howitzer, very similar to the ZSU-122 in Soviet service. The Type 83 is a 152mm self-propelled howitzer. While an older weapon system, it's still in service in some units today. The Type 54-1 self-propelled howitzer, one of PLA's first locally designed self-propelled artillery, carried a derivative of the Soviet M1938 or M30 122mm howitzer on a Type 85 armoured personnel carrier chassis, a strengthened YW531 chassis. Developed for this type uh, of the Type 54-1 SPH. Um, it's interesting that they should mount such a large gun on such a small chassis, but there it is. The A100 is a 300mm 10-tube multiple rocket launcher. The vehicle launch, the launch vehicle is based on the Titan TAS 4500 8x8 wheeled truck chassis developed by Tian Special Vehicle Manufactory. The PHL-3 is a truck-mounted self-propelled 12-tube 300mm long-range multiple rocket launcher system. The Type 70 MRL is a rocket projector vehicle based on the chassis of the Type 63 armoured personnel carrier. The PHL-81 is a truck-mounted self-propelled 122mm multiple rocket launcher system. I could continue, but my objective is not to do a deep dive into all the equipment of the PLA. It's more an attempt to provide viewers an idea of the various weapon systems used by the PLA, especially when they're mentioned by name in my TO&E. I must point out, uh, point out that even with this reduced detail, this is not a video for a layperson. I have no doubt that 90% of the viewers will experience a brain hemorrhage after five minutes of me describing the details of the PLA brigade structure. Let's now move on to the opinion part of this, is, uh, which basically is how such an invasion could uh, play out. My um, last video on the ROCA, or Republic of China Army, provides more details on the various options the PLA have in any invasion of Taiwan. For this video, I'll move straight to the what I consider is the most likely viable strategy. In this strategy, the PRC decides victory requires taking Taipei quickly before significant involvement and which will hopefully result in Taiwan surrendering. While this may be possible if it happens quickly enough, uh, for some reason I feel Taiwan will not surrender until the entire island is occupied, which at the current moment is a very unlikely scenario. I'll use a board game map for this analysis and this shows the board game map that I'll be using. Unfortunately for the PRC and very fortunately for the ROC, uh, Taipei occupies a very defensible position. Landing in this position then driving down towards Taipei would be the only viable strategy and this would require a significantly large military force. The terrain between a possible landing site and Taipei is not optimal for attack. Some commentators have suggested multiple landings are optimal. Personally, I feel they do not understand the difficulty of successfully making even one amphibious landing, much less two or three. Once you see the force mixes, you'll quickly see this may not be a viable strategy, that is a multiple landing, and a single landing strategy is the safest and um, optimal strategy. However, keeping some amphibious forces in being to threaten a second landing is viable as it would require the ROCA 
to deploy forces to cover other areas far from the main combat zone. If the PLA only used the 73rd Group Army to land in this location, they could initially land with two brigades, with two light brigades following up probably the following day. This would be able to make an initial landing assuming the invasion location was a surprise and there was a significant level of interdiction occurring just before the landing occurs and immediately afterwards. This also assumes the uh, ROC's SSMs were generally ineffective or inflicted minimal losses. I must point out these are rather large assumptions and paint an incredibly positive situation for the PLA. Only possible if total surprise was achieved, which may be possible if the PLA only used a single um, group army in order to make this initial landing. The most likely scenario would be a dawn landing by two amphibious brigades, which should achieve the required 3 to 1 superiority to secure a perimeter. The ROCA would almost certainly immediately launch a counterattack with whatever they possess close by. I'm uncertain which brigade would be the closest, but at least one would be in a position to hit the PRC brigades probably by the end of the day. Personally, I feel this may well push the PLA forces back into the sea, but if it did not, it would certainly stop them cold. Once the ROCA possessed M1 main battle tanks, I suspect them pushing the PLA forces into the sea scenario would be considerably more likely. While the amphibious brigades would not have much offensive capability against an armoured brigade, it would possess a significant amount of anti-tank guided weapon systems to defend against an armoured attack. The use of M1 Abrams tanks would reduce the effectiveness of this capability dramatically, thus increase the chance of them being pushed into the sea which would be an unmitigated disaster for the PRC. Assuming they were not pushed into the sea on D plus 2, we would probably have a log jab on the beach and the ROCA would probably get a 4th brigade into the fray. The ROCA would have to be careful about other landings, so would need to keep the rest of their forces holding their current positions, but would be immediately mobilising their reserve brigades. At least seven would pop up around Taipei Low, probably by D plus three. The PLA could launch two more landings from distant locations, which could arrive by D plus three or later. However, these would no longer have the element of surprise. Landing in the face of prepared troops is one of the most difficult military problems anyone could possibly face, but I suspect the PLA would have no choice but to at least try to divert some some of the ROC forces away from their main landing, even if they risk very heavy losses. It's unlikely Taipei could be taken using this scenario. Now let's look at um, possibly more the real world, which includes the ROC's SSMs, or surface-to-surface -surface missiles. This would represent a major threat to any PRC naval asset. The ROC possesses a large infantry of surface-to-surface -surface missiles, which could be used to target any PRC naval asset. While the PRC could use anti-missile SAMs to destroy these SSMs, such as the HQ-9, some will always get through. Any initial amphibious landing will suffer significant losses. Later waves may fa fare better, as the ROC may have expended most of their SSMs on the first wave, but the first wave would take significant casualties, unless, of course, it was a out-of-the-blue surprise. The losses could also be minimised by using screening lighter naval assets, but this can only go so far. If the PLA uses both the 72nd and 73rd Group Army to land in this location, which means total surprise is virtually impossible, they could land with four brigades, amphibious brigades, with four brigades following up, um, either later that day or the following day. Assuming losses on the way, this should be able to repel any initial ROCA counterattack, even if the ROCA was using M1 Abrams. On D2, the second wave of additional four brigades would uh, follow up quickly and would secure any frontline position as well as starting to push further in. The ROCA would obviously bring up additional brigades to hold the front line. By D plus 3, the ROCA would immobilise their reserve brigades, although they would be unlikely to be mobile yet. Uh, the PRC would have landed their heavy brigades on D plus 3, 
and that would be able to almost certainly push the ROCA back. Once the ROCA mobilised their reserves and saw that two-thirds of the PLA's amphibious forces were present, they would bring their remaining brigades into the fight. It would be critical for the PLA to capture a port city as soon as possible and also capture an airfield as soon as possible. And while I feel this would be a desperate fight, it may be just possible. By D plus 4, a port would probably have been taken, but it would still be within artillery range and yet not suitable for normal or standard unloading of supplies. But some would still be able to unload. With an airfield in control, troops could also be brought in by air transport and probably also more likely bringing in supplies by air transport. While I feel the PRC could establish a beachhead and advance in enough to create a defensive perimeter, I suspect that in a few more days the PLA would be suffering significant logistic issues and would be unable to take Taipei in this scenario. While the PRC would have air supremacy, I suspect the US, US aid would start to arrive, as well as US offensive action by the SSNXs. Even if all the US did was to airlift in SSMs, that would be sufficient to cause significant logistic issues for the PRC. It is at this point a second amphibious invasion is often stated as an optimal strategy. However, even though the bulk of the ROCA would be engaged, they would at least leave their regional defence commands in place, and these contain frontline mechanised forces. Once again, landing troops in the face of dug-in prepared troops is very difficult. If in this scenario, the third, the PLA uses the 72nd, the 73rd and 74th Group Army, as well as all the air transportable troops, to land in this location, they could initially land with seven brigades, with six brigades following up. Assuming losses on the way in, they should be able to repel any initial ROCA counterattack with ease, even if the ROCA was using M1 Abrams, as well as taking a major airfield very quickly. On D plus two, an additional six brigades could land and prepare for a push towards the port facilities in the north, as well as securing the left flank or right flank. At these odds, it would be difficult for the ROCA to hold the open terrain down south, and they would most likely fall back to better defensive positions. On D plus three, an additional three heavy brigades would land and prepare for a push towards the port facilities in the north. At these odds, the PLA would probably take the port and drive the ROC forces back in the south as well. As well as the, um, on the other hand, as the bulk of the ROCA forces would be in the front, any advance in that direction would probably be not as great. On D plus four, the PLA would almost certainly secure a port, allowing for supply at least, and continue to drive towards Taipei. ROCA forces from the south would now be coming up north to hold that flank and would most likely attempt counterattacks. At this point, the PLA would have at least 16 frontline brigades and a lesser number of um, other brigades which would be in reserve in the front line. Of course, the PLA brigades would have suffered losses on the way in, so it would certainly not be top, top, you know, full strength. This does not really look like a winning position to me, especially since the war would now become a slugfest, which would mean it becomes a war of logistics. This is not what the PRC needs to win. As with my previous ROCA video, I cannot see how the PLA would possess the necessary ground forces for the necessary quick win. The war would likely bog down and the PRC into a PRC attempting to interdict Taiwan supply lines and the US trying to interdict the PRC supply lines. Both sides would have advantages and disadvantages, but in the long term, the economic strength of the US-led alliance would make a long, drawn-out war a losing strategy for the PRC. And so we come to an end of my part 22 of my organisational video series, in this case covering the PLA armed forces that would most likely be involved in an invasion of Taiwan. I just hope against hope that we avoid any form of military conflict, as in the long run both the peoples of China and Taiwan will suffer in if such a war should occur. Allah guten Ding, kommen zu einem Ende.